And we're back, it's the one and only. Check it out, man. Still moving, still grooving. Straight from Las Vegas, Nevada. Fresh off the flight. Welcome to Texas. My man Dizzy Riders in the building. What up? What's up, baby? How you feeling, man? Blast. I see you, I see you smoke. You know I don't smoke. Oh, you don't? I don't. You don't mind it though, right? I don't mind it, man. My man Fuck right it. I'm gonna catch some secondhand smoke on this one, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but yo, real quick, man. Uh, you're, you're in Texas. Yes, sir. Uh, it's been a minute. It's been a while. It's been a while, but how does it feel to finally be, be, be on a flight, getting ready to do a show? It feels good, man. It feels uh, uh, surreal, I guess. You know what I'm saying? It's been a while. You know, I don't really know how to feel yet. <laughs> well, let me say something. Like I, I know, as a, as an artist, you were talking right now off the record. Since 2011, you've been on the road. You've been touring. You've been doing shows. You've been removed of that for now a year, right? Yeah. It goes without saying. Do you, do you feel like now that you you have a newfound appreciation for that even more so than you did before? Because I, I, you strike me as an artist that always appreciated it. Yeah. But like now, it's like, damn, did I take that for granted? You know what Word. I mean? Yeah, we was actually even talking about that a little more on the way here. Like, yeah, you know, you just appreciate it a little more. Like even just being outside of your city and you know the little things, just being able to walk to the store and just embrace something new. And just as an artist, you're going city to city to city. You know, sometimes you don't really stop and embrace it. But when it's kind of taken from you and you come back, it's the little things just feel a little different. Hell yeah. I feel you. Well, look, the name of the show is Cutting Out the Beats Experience. Goes without saying, experience is the best teacher. We want to get into your story, your experience, how you came into the game, how it got, how it got started. Uh, just kind of give us a, a, quick, a quick recap. When did it start? When did you get bit by the bug? When did you decide, yo, I want to be a rapper? What was that moment? Where um, my mom was actually in the music industry. Uh, my mom was a concert promoter. Oh, wow. Uh, before I was born and back in Flint, Michigan. And um, she kind of had that music industry bug. You know, she got bit long before we was even walking and shit, you know? So mm. as we got older, she could just kind of see the talent in us a little bit, you know? So she just... Uh, it's like, hey, y'all want to be a part of this shit? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm in this shit. I feel like I could, if y'all want to do it, I feel like I could help. My mom started ghostwriting for us. I was like oh, wow. eight years old, you know what I'm saying? And she did that. She like, my mom was my ghostwriter. I didn't even know what a ghostwriter was. I wasn't really even familiar with rap. This is how I was introduced to rap. It was like being in the music industry. Gotcha. Yeah, I didn't really know much outside of Bone Thugs and Harmony. Well, so, well, speaking of Bone Thugs and Harmony, which I was going to get to here in a second. Hold on, let, let's park a lot of Bone Thugs real quick. But you're talking about your mom. So she essentially molded you Word. to become a recording artist. Yeah, yeah. My mom actually kind of, we, we went through the full-blown, we weren't signed to a major, but yeah. that was the only way to get on was through a major at those times. Mm -hmm. So she was like molding us and preparing us to be signed to a major. So I actually got like a real major label experience in my younger days, which is why I essentially um, decided to do in, go to independent rap. One of my favorite questions is always, did you ever have any other rap names other than your current one? So was it always Dizzy Wright or was it something else at one point? No, nah, yeah, uh, I used to go by Dizzy D Flashy. Ah, Dizzy D Flashy. Yeah, Dizzy D Flashy, yeah. We had a crew called Flashy Inc. And everybody in the crew kind of had like, you know, my boy Moski, uh, <laughs> he was twin Flashy. You know, that was my <laughs> twin. Uh, then we had a boy Flashy and kid Flashy. Oh, man, you got to bring, you gotta bring, uh, you gotta bring it back. You yeah, gotta bring it and back. I was Dizzy D Flashy. <laughs> you said Bone Thugs in Harmony. I don't know how much truth there is into this, but I was told Lazy Bone is your uncle. Is that true? Not by blood. Not by blood. Okay. My mom was the role manager for Bone Thugs and Harmony when I was a kid. Got and you. they became family. And when they became family, we became family. Like, and it just became Uncle Lay, Uncle Cray, Uncle Wish. You know what I'm saying? And um, But not by blood. Like, my mom's not related to Lazy Bone. And I'm and I wanna I wanna clear that up for people because yeah. some people be feeling like, hold on, this lazy bone nephew, maybe he got yeah. <laughs> pushed to the front, you know? No, nah, I wasn't like that. It was just uh, lazy bone had a lot of love for my mom. My mom, you know, had a lot of love for lazy bone on some brother and sister shit, and we became 
you know, like family. Salute to your mom, by the way. You know, me being a concert promoter and me being someone that came up on that side of the business, you know, I have uh, uh, the utmost respect for people that go through that grind because it really is a grind. But the one thing that you say is that she got close with Bone. And, and one thing about concert promotion, if you know how to do it right, uh, you know, you can build create relationships. Real, you can create and build real relationships. And you mentioned Bone Thugs and Army. Right. I can't imagine being an eight year old. And, and at that time, you know, looking up to Bone Thugs and Harmony, you know, myself, that was my favorite group of all time. I consider them the greatest rap group of all time. Me too. Uh, so uh, to have, you know, Lazy be, you know, your uncle, that, that, that's, a, that's a big thing. But yeah, I had heard that, you know what I'm saying? I was like, yo, I never, I always wanted to know that, you know, so. You know what's even crazier is that, like, I started off as a youth reporter first. My mom came to us and that's how, that was my introduction to the music industry first was I was doing interviews just like this. Oh wow. Me and my little brother, uh, KJ, we, uh, my mom was like, she had all this access to, cause she became a publicist and she had all this access to these different events, all this shit going on, just like you. And we started like a newsletter called JFK, Just For Kids. Oh, that's dope. And we would go to these different events and interview people, like I interviewed Nelly and the Saint Lunatics when I was a kid. I interviewed Boys the Men, you know. Hey, favorite I, group of all time right there. I interviewed Nate Dogg before he passed away. Dope. Yeah, I got like, it was a bunch of like, you know, youth reporter shit that I was doing and then that's when my mom was like, pushed us towards the music. Is that how you met Kobe Bryant? Cause I seen the photo so That time. is how I met Kobe Bryant. Uh, I was doing my youth reporter shit. Oh wow! And that's how uh, that's how I ended up there. People was like, hey, man, he seemed like he had some money. <laughs> he met all these <laughs> niggas. Like, what's up? What's going on? Now my mom just had access to a lot of different events because she was involved, and she would just get like extra little credentials for me and my brother. And um, you know, I. It's five of us. My mom was a single parent of five kids, but it was only me and my little brother. So we really was trying to pave the way to create a better life for our, our family. Mm -hmm. So that was always the mission, you know, but um, no money ever came out of that, you know? I'll so you. as you get older, you know, it starts changing your mindset about the shit. From an interviewing perspective, especially at that age, what was the most memorable? Was it Kobe? Um, no, I didn't interview Kobe, actually. Um, I just, we were at the All-Star game and um, I just saw Kobe. And I was like, <laughs> I, I gotta get a picture with Kobe, come on. I saw AI too, I tried to get the AI, but AI had a million people around, yeah, him, you yeah, know what I'm saying? So I ain't get that pic, but um, nah, the most memorable, uh, I would say, the most in memorable interview I did, I would say, is probably with uh, Tyrese. Oh wow, that's interesting. Yeah, Tyrese. He uh, he was just he had told he was just like they the future, you know? Yeah, they the future, and and I was like the future. That's kind of fire, and that became <laughs> me and my brother's rap group name. Oh wow, the future. It, yeah, the future. We had got that. Shout out to Tyrese. Tyrese, you probably don't remember the young nigga, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gave me, you gave us our rap group name, man. We ran with that. So, at what point did rap become a real career? At what point did it finally happen and it clicked? Everything that you worked for as a youngster, everything that your mom molded you and prepared you for, when did it become like, yo, this is really moving now? Word. Um, I was, I had moved back to Vegas. Um, and shout out to my boy R3D, cause he kind of changed my life. You know what I'm saying? He had a home studio mm -hmm. and I had never seen a home studio. My mom was in the music industry. So all the studios I had seen were all big production. And you know, I didn't even know studios could be like that. And uh, I had went over my boy's crib. This was maybe uh, uh, my 11th grade year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went over there and he was recording himself. And, I was like, you did this shit here? Yeah. He was like, yeah. I was like, damn, you know, I got some, I got some rhymes. He's like, can I, can I put that shit down? <laughs> and he was like, hell yeah, you know? And I would go over there and fuck with him every day and just, you know, put my rhymes down and shit like that. And like, I just started uploading that shit to MySpace. And uh, shout out to my boy Moski, you know, who's here right now. He my hype man. And, you know, at that time I didn't really want to, 
I had been through a lot with the whole music shit with my mom. Yeah. That shit was just draining. I just, I just like the rhyme and I like to do it without all the extra shit. Yeah. You know, it just felt better that way. And I, I didn't really want to take it serious, but most of you was like, hey, nigga, you kind of tight. <laughs> you yeah. like, nigga, hey, so y'all better show most of some love because he the reason y'all got all the albums. You know what I'm saying? Hey, no, hey. But, but you know what I'm saying? Because people be thinking this shit glamorous, but it's not really glamorous whenever you've been in it and, and whenever you get deep in, it becomes not just uh, work, but it becomes something that you have to really love and be passionate about. Absolutely. Because it has the highs and the lows, you know? Yeah, and, I, and, and, like, and like, here's the thing, man. Like, I started doing this shit in 11th grade and I think over the summer I started making like some party records and mm -hmm. I started, you know, uh, I started throwing parties at this spot called Club Frozen. Mm. Uh, the owner had gave me two weeks out of the month. And how old were you at this point? I was, uh, I was about to, it was about to be my senior year. I was actually living with Moski. My mom had kicked me out. <laughs> what city? Hold on, what city? Were we, we in Vegas. Oh, so you were in Vegas. Yeah, right we on the east side of Vegas. You know what I'm saying? Me and uh, Moski both stayed on Boulder Highway. And, um, and yeah, my mom kicked me out. I went to go live with Moski. His mom, uh, his mom had took me in and uh, I was over there for a little while and I was trying to get emancipated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole emancipation shit fell through the roof. You know what I'm saying? So I, I lingered at Moski house a little longer. <laughs> uh, and then after that, um, I had got my own apartment my senior year. So I got like this, and my, I don't want you to think I had like an apartment, I was balling, I was doing my thing. Nah, I just had like this little studio apartment, yeah. you know, and I was throwing parties. I was throwing parties and that's how I was kind of taking care of myself. And uh, yeah, so uh, my first DJ that I ever had, his name was DJ Fame. Shout out to Fame, wherever you at in the world right now. Um, I asked him, he was the DJ at the club. I'm like, hey man, can you play this record? I just want to see. Yeah, if you the got crowd it. responds. Just want to see if you got it. Yeah, yeah I just right. want to see if I got it, baby. <laughs> it's like, I got you. He played that shit. And yeah, that shit changed my life. When I seen, when I seen everybody respond to it the way they did, I was like, oh shit. Oh shit. <laughs> I was like, damn. Yeah. That shit just did something to me. Now, now, then at that point, you're like, I might be onto something. Yeah, at that point. So at that point... Uh, 106 and Park was still on TV. Yeah. And they was doing something called Wild Out Wednesday. I remember that. Right? So one of my fans on Facebook sent my video to 106 and Park, right? And they emailed her back and she hit me like, yo, 106 and Park just hit me back and said you could come audition. And I was like, what the fuck? And she was like, what's your email? I want to forward it to you. I'm like, what? Forward this shit to me, right? So she forwarded it to me. I'm like, damn, this shit really from 106 and Park. So I'm like, all right, cool, fuck it. I'm going I'm to go audition. Like me and Moski, I'm like, we going to go audition. You know what I'm saying? We went out there and we did the audition. But the thing was, was like, we had to scrape up the money to get out there. And we had practice and did all this shit. And it was just like, you know, like a two minute audition. But when we got in the room, my CD wasn't working. Oh, wow. Well. So I was like motherfucking panicking low key. Like, fuck, we came all the way out here to New York for this audition. We got to be able to audition, baby. Like, and I must have tapped that motherfucker or something and it started working. We just jumped into it all fast. We just didn't feel like it was the best impression. We was just like, God damn. So it didn't, nothing happened out of that. Seven months later, they hit me like, yo, come to 106 in part. You, you niggas got in. We like, what the fuck? We like, <laughs> it's been seven, eight months. Blew my mind. I'm in high school. I'm living by myself. I get the call. I'm just like, <laughs> oh shit, nigga. I call Moski. I'm like, nigga, we got in. What you want? So we had to scrape them. I'm like, but they ain't paying for shit. We gotta get. We gotta scrape the money up again to go out there. We like, fuck it, we'll figure it out. We scrape the money up, we go out there, we win. We went to the Wild Out Wednesday shit. And so th this footage can be found online? Yeah. It's on YouTube. That right. shit online, right? All right, we got, we're gonna look it up, we're gonna look it yeah. up. Yeah, nah, it. yeah, some clips out there for sure. We won. So I was like, <laughs> the, te the, the buzz in the city was kind of like, you know, it was there. Like, uh-oh, this nigga went out there and won, okay. 
I was kind of, I, I wanted to build off that, but the thing was, was there was a jerk movement going on at the time. Mm. And we were like a part of that. But the thing was, I realized th that like, you know, I was more of an artist and not just one lane. Yeah. So I never, you, like there's no music videos of my jerking songs. You know, I would put the jerking songs out for the parties, but the music videos I was putting out was the real shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And um, I think it was the 106 in Park that really kind of shift things into gear, you know? Cause after that, like, I just wanted more accomplishments. So let's expedite. At what point did the, fu the funk volume chapter of your career start happening? Or how did that come about? Because you know, one thing that I took from just not only observing and watching, not only as a as an observer and as a fan, but just in general was like, not also making the band shit, but it really looked like the 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 the, the label, that whole crew, that collective. It yeah. was something that was pieced together, not something of like like you said, like you and your homie that came up together. You know what I'm saying? Like, so how did that come together? How did that come about? The origin of it, like how you how you were. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um. Man, you know what's so this like? <laughs> it's funny, man, because I I feel like I want to tell you the longer version. Cause I don't normally tell this version, this this version of the shit. But I tell you, like, there was an artist in the city. This is kind of like the longer version on how funk volume, how we even yeah it became a thing. Be how it even coexisted, right, in the same fucking time, right? <laughs> so like. There was an artist in Vegas who had sent me a text and said that he was opening up for YG in front of Sheik's Shoes, right? The uh, Boulevard Mall in Vegas. If you from Vegas, you know the Boulevard Mall. And I'm thinking like, oh shit, this nigga opening up for YG. YG had just dropped Tooted and Booted and was doing his thing, right? him and Ty Dolla Sign. So I'm thinking like, wait, hold the fuck up. How this nigga opening up for YG? What this nigga doing that I'm not doing? Mm -hmm. I'm finna go check this shit out. So I go up there, and when I get up there, it's a competition. And I'm like, and YG's the special guest. So I'm like, he kind of flexed, and made it seem like he was opening for him. Didn't mention the competition, but he probably was just trying to get supporters out there. Well, I got there, I'm like, there's a competition, what's going on? They like, oh, Sheik and Def Jam are doing a competition. They're going to like six different cities and picking two artists from every city. And then they got to go to California and they're going to pick a winner. And then that winner going to get a, 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 a deal with Def Jam, a single, a single deal with Def Jam. And I'm like, what? When's the cutoff? They like, you can sign up now. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, fuck that. I'm about, I, let me sign up. My, I got my motherfucking CD in the car. I signed up, and then I won the Vegas part, right? Yeah. So when I won the Vegas part, I got to go to California. Well, when you got to California, it was like a couple days or some shit, and then like the ending of it was they gave you a couple beats. You had to write a song to the beats, and then all of the artists performed that song. Then the judges picked their top two, and then those top two do their own original music, and then they pick the winner, and then that winner gets the single deal. Right. Well, I won that shit and Funk Volume was there. Dame was there. So that's how they saw me for the first time. I was motherfucking trying to get a Def Jam deal. So when my managers at the time, shout out to Marcus and Miles because they held me down. Um, you know, they know I was focused on trying to get this Def Jam shit, you know, Ray, <laughs> I was locked in on this shit. So when, you know, when Dame came with the funk volume shit, I wasn't even trying to hear none of that. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, nigga, I'm about to go holler at Def Jam. <laughs> Fuck you mean? <laughs> this nigga talking about some independent shit, nigga. I done did it. I done worked up to the deal, baby. <laughs> but, man, I, done, I motherfucking go sit down with Def Jam and Def Jam all... They already got the single. I thought I thought I was I thought it was gonna be a single of my shit. Oh, so it was like a, a pre-made single. Yeah, <laughs> I get up in there, nigga. It's a whole ass 
song ready for me. And the song, and they was just like, you know, we're going for like a, they were trying to find like a Kid Cudi type of vibe. Yeah. And you know, at that time, you know, man, I'm, I'm just full blown hip hop, baby. I couldn't believe it. I was like, mm -hmm. so I turned it down. So, and I felt bad because I was like, man, I went and won that damn competition and turned the deal down. They could have got one of these other niggas. Yeah. And one of them niggas probably could have had an opportunity and been the next Kid Cudi. You know what I'm saying? I felt bad about that shit. But that wasn't what I was trying to do. Like, I already did a bunch of that shit with my mom. Yeah. I was like, hell no. Nah. I don't want no prepared music. What the fuck is this? I'm like, y'all don't even want to hear the shit I got. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, y'all don't even want to hear the shit I got. This shit great. Fuck this shit, man. I'm, I'm out of here. And then my partner was like, hey, man, uh, you know, Dame, th them funk volume dudes, man, they fucking, they moving. And I'm like, let me see, man. <laughs> and we hopped online and he showed me Hobson. And, you know, Hobson was on his Raw tour at the time. And, you know, you know, the contacts and shit was a little different for me. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, but, you know, my my guys was like, man, maybe you should just sit down and hear him out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, I, and we sat down with Dame and Dame was trying to piece together something, uh, piece together a label that could be diverse. You know, he didn't want it to be just narrowed in on kind of like the direction that they were going. You know what I'm saying? Cause they were big in, with the Juggalos and shout out to the Juggalos cause they showed me love too. I got love for the Juggalos, but you know, Juggalos ain't really coming out to really fuck with Dizzy Wright like that. You yeah, know, feel, that was more they shit and they accepted me and I accepted them and it was all love. But Dame didn't want it to just be that, you know, he wanted to make it more diverse. And that's how I, and that's how I got to be a part of Funk Volume. So you guys have the run, and it was a great run, by may I add, you know what I'm saying? You guys clicking on all cylinders at one point. You guys are touring. Every one of the artists that were part of, was part of Funk Volume was having a lot of success, and then obviously it disbands. I don't want to harp too much on the, you know, the, how it disbanded because obviously it's been well documented. Let's just kind of speed up to recently. Obviously, Damon Hop, they did an interview together, or they took a photo together, some shit, right? Yeah. And obviously, you know, the the fandom went up, you know, everybody's like, yo, are they gonna, you know, reunite? Is there gonna be a project? You know, just speaking directly to you and, and your perspective on everything, uh, you obviously have a whole other situation going on now. You've been very active on, on the recording side, especially during the pandemic, man, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, right. Does that interest you at all? To, to, to do anything in the form of maybe, you know, reuniting, whether it's on a, on a show, on a tour, on, a, on, a, on an album, on a song, whatever it may be. Does that interest you at all? Uh, yeah. I mean, it interests me just because I know the fans want it. You know what I'm saying? Um, but shit like that just can't be forced. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It's got to be organic. And maybe we'll get there, maybe we won't, you know, but, you know, it's got to be organic. And everybody has their own vibe. You know what I'm saying? It's... Part of the reason why the fans didn't get more music while we were all together, you know, yeah. because even when we were together, we weren't really together. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Everybody was kind of doing their own thing and everybody were kind of set in their own ways. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And uh, still kind of like that. So if some if some kind of way organically we could come together and give the fans something special, that would be fire. But maybe a show. Because you guys are individual artists, and I don't think people understood, because a lot of times when they, they see you guys paired up together, they automatically assume, oh, they, 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 they came up together, they're homies, they're, they're a group, and, and you guys aren't. You know, you guys never were. So I think that's one thing that I wanted to clarify. But for the record, how is your relationship now in 2021 with, you know, Jaron Benton, with Hobson, with Dame? My relationship is cool with everybody. You've always been cool. Yeah, copacetic with everybody. Well, let's talk about your, your project now. You and everything that you got going. You you have your own imprint still moving. Yes, sir. You have your store. Yes, sir. You have your merchandise. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us how that came about. Uh, tell us the meaning behind it. Because what, what I think of still moving, I'm thinking mom's taking you as a performer as a, at a young age. 
and she got you moving at an early age. The fact that you're this deep in the game, you're still moving. That's what I'm thinking. Yes, sir. Give me the origin. Let us know. Just uh, uh, applying it to life, I just realized, like, um, you know, even they say if you tap out of the music industry for a couple months, you know, and you come back, you'll be completely, you might be on some different shit. The game might already be progressing. You know what I'm saying? Kind of got to keep your eyes on everything. So it's like still moving is just a part of life, applying it to everything, making sure you're willing to get up and be active all the time. For me in 2013, I just wanted to keep it going. You know, yeah, I had sure. started touring in 2012 and I just wanted to keep it going. I started out in the van, in, in the in the van, and then got to the Sprinter, and then got to the bus, and yeah. I was just like, "Yo, you just gotta keep going, keep going." I was just putting that energy out there, and then I made the song "Still Moving," and from there, it just became the motto. You know what I'm saying? And then when the funk volume shit dismantled, I just had to truck through that shit and still moving. That shit, you know, the same energy that I was dishing out, even though I was dishing it out. Now I'm really applying it, you yeah. know, the shit that I've been, I'm like listening to some of the shit that I put in my music and that shit was like inspiring me, you know what I'm saying? So It was a mentality, like a Mamba mentality, you like, still moving, yeah, you know what I mean? Yes, sir, yes, sir. And that shit got me through, it got me through. And um, from there, I just wanted to keep building on it and turn it into something real, more of a movement more of a platform that can be utilized and from there i i wanted to be a business owner you know what i'm saying um i didn't know exactly what kind of business i wanted yeah. you know what i'm saying but i love clothes it's in my field i should have closed the clothes fire bro yeah i appreciate that yeah my boy angel who i opened the business with he was already running a clothing store. I was touring, so I shopped with him a lot before I went on tour. He always showed me love. I just fucked with the environment. He had stopped doing that to go sell weed. <laughs> and he was working in the dispensary, and then I got a weed strain in that dispensary. So we still had a strong relationship. OG, huh? Yeah, so it was, all, it was all cool. And I came to him like, yo, man, I'm trying to open up a business. Maybe you got some pointers. He like, man, I got, some, I got a plan. <laughs> And, you know, he had a plan and I had a brand and we just came together and, and put that together. And from there, we was just able to build off that. And I wanted a spot that when you're in Vegas, I feel like nobody really wants to feel like they have to work in Vegas. When you go to Vegas, you want to let loose a little bit, chill. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You don't want to be doing the shit that you already probably doing all the time when you at home, which is like working or being in a studio environment. You want to be out, talk to the hoes, gamble a little bit, <laughs> drink a little bit in the casino, do your thing, um, maybe shop a little bit. And because of that, you know, I wanted to have a spot where people could stop by. And you know what I'm saying? It don't have to feel like work or feel like they're going out of the Vegas elements. You actually getting, you know, an organic Vegas vibe, the Vegas vibe that we bring in. And I feel like it's a piece of, of the city now. So it's, it's, it's cool. Well, look, man, I, I want to leave with this, man. Obviously, your journey, you know, big ups. You know, got to gotta show you love on that, man. You know, being, starting from, you know, uh, someone that was molded at a young age. Or, you know, molded to be an entertainer. Going to being an interviewer at such a young age. And as as it continued to manifest to an actual career, appreciate to that. being on the cover of the Double XL, like you said, going from the car to the Sprinter to the tour bus, and working with all these artists, what is the one piece of advice that you would not only give to a younger version of yourself, but to somebody out there that might be watching that looks up to you, that might be wanting to you know pursue this as a career or as a journey? What would you say is the most important thing that you've learned over the course of your career, and since you started from where you're at now, what would you say that is? Um, uh, whew. It's a lot. There's a lot, a lot of ways you can, yeah. you can skin that cat. But let me ask you, what would you say something that you would give to, to you know, a young kid that might be watching right now? I'd say stay, stay consistent. You know what I'm saying? And, and 
stay true to yourself. You know, self love is powerful. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot that I would say. It's like, don't take anything personal. You know what I'm saying? On your journey, just use that as, as, as a tool to be able to create better music, better art, whatever it is that you do. But that question is always hard when people say that and it's like one thing, I'd be like, man, if I could talk to a younger version of myself or just the young shit, we, we gonna have a conversation. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And like, we gonna talk because ask the questions, talk to your big homies, you know what I'm saying? Get the advice, soak that shit in and like, you know what I'm saying? Take that with you on your journey and like, you don't need everything too fast. Life can be short, but life can also be long. You know what I'm saying? Plant them seeds so they can grow the right way. You know what I mean? Like, you got time. I tell them you got I time. I always tell these young guys, man, you, you know, you leave the way you come in. So if you, if you come in fast, you're going to leave fast. That's right. So put in the work. Um, to close, what's next? What do you have in store for Dizzy Wright? Still moving. Tomorrow we're going to rip this show. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Finally, back uh, on the stage. That's right. I can't wait. You need to grab the mic like The Rock, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Finally, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> For real. <laughs> that's it. For real. Nah, but um, I'm going to give the people another album this year. Because um, I, I got a lot of shit that I want to talk about. A lot of shit that I got to address, you know. And I got to keep dishing these vibes out, you know. Absolutely. I keep growing and I feel like I keep wanting to give the people, you know, pieces of art that they can keep with them in this time. So uh, definitely expect another album this year. But other than that, man, I'm hoping and praying that I can get back out here and get on this stage, man. I miss yeah. Yeah. being on stage. I'm, I'm a touring artist. I fuck with the people. I, this shit has been organic. Yep. So like, you know, I'm excited to get back out there and, and just you know what I'm saying? Feed off the energy. There's nothing like converting a live audience to fans, man. There's nothing like it. It's a high unlike anything else. Higher than, better than that. No, way better than this, <laughs> I swear. You ain't never lie. Hey, to your fans, you say what to close out? I love y'all, man. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Hold it down. You know what I'm saying? Y'all got this shit. You know what I'm saying? And I'll see y'all soon. Y'all already know this is not the Beats Experience. This is Dizzy right? Texas just lifted up their uh, their statewide mandate of wearing masks. Uh -oh. We're officially reopening, so hopefully we can get Dizzy to relocate soon, all right? We out. <laughs>